context of interconnectedness and the law of oneness, how do you believe the concept of energy exchange influences our daily lives, relationships and our surroundings? The law of oneness implies that there is no fundamental division between individuals and everything in the world is interconnected, while tangible connections between events, experiences and people may not be immediately apparent, energetic ties and connection exist in all our lives. Inlay Kesh is a phrase that originated from the Mayan people, which embodies the concept of interconnectedness and oneness. It can be translated as I am you and you are me, or I am another, yourself. This respectful greeting is similar to Namaste and emphasizes the impact of every action on others, encouraging respect and love for all beings. Oneness implies that everything in the universe is fundamentally interconnected and united. In other words, a common underlying unity connects everything despite their apparent diversity and separation. This unity is found in a single essence or consciousness that permeates all existence, linking every aspect of the universe and the idea that separateness is an illusion. The idea of oneness can be likened to a tapestry where every individual represents a thread woven into the fabric of existence. These threads intersect, weaving into places, things and other individuals, thus forming a complex web that binds all aspects of life together. Every connection between threads contributes to the rich pattern reflecting the entwined nature of our shared experience. The law of oneness acts like a mirror of emojis, reflecting your energy, thoughts, intentions and past experiences. Each emoji represents a different feeling or experience. For instance, an array of smiley faces might represent feelings of joy, while angry emojis represent jealousy and anger. Positive relationships leave traces of warmth and love in the form of heart emojis. On the other hand, toxic relationships can deplete your energy with lack of appreciation and drudgery, symbolized by a wilted rose. Your silhouette reflects both your empowering and limiting beliefs. Etched upon your form are the words like, I am not enough, or affirmations of kindness and beauty, illuminating your energy field. The mirror reflects your present state and unveils the chapters of your journey, revealing the impact of past experiences, relationships and choices. Fresh organic foods fuel your body and lighten those areas, while dark colours represent the toxins absorbed by your body, causing decay in your organs and tissues. Throughout the mirror's reflection, echoes of past lives weave together a tapestry of interconnected destinies, lessons learned and karmic debts. Your upbringing, education and societal influences are reflected in various emojis including the weight of societal expectations. It creates a complex picture of your identity influenced by more than just your childhood upbringing. Emotions surge like tidal waves expressed through vibrant hues and shifting shades. Each feeling leaves its mark on the canvas of your being from the depths of sorrow to the heights of ecstasy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one state to another. Therefore, there is no death. All matter shifts from one state to the next. Everything in existence is in a state of dynamism like water, it constantly transitions from steam to water, ice and back to its original form. Greg Braden's book, The Divine Matrix states, when something is holographic, it exists wholly within every fragment of itself, no matter how many pieces it's divided into. This illustration conveys that no matter how finely we divide the universe, each segment mirrors the whole universe only on a smaller scale. The same principle is represented in Michael Talbot's book, The Holographic Universe, which provides evidence of how our existence and experience can be viewed through a holographic model. This idea of the whole contained in each piece is the basis of the holographic principles. 
The holographic universe suggests that the physical world we believe is real is an illusion. For example, energy fields are decoded by our brain into a 3D picture to give the illusion of a physical world. You are connected to everything in your reality and your vibration manifests it. It's the same concept that if you want to change the world, change yourself first. How do you believe acknowledging the interconnectedness of all things can impact our decision-making processes, relationships, and our manifestations? Sure, the oneness law or concept can be illustrated using the macrocosm analogy. This means a smaller system can represent a larger one and vice versa. Many aspects of your life reflect the quality of your energy. For example, the behavior of a bank teller or having a car accident or avoiding one, your health, your aches and pains, your appliances that break down or the ones that last a lifetime, a conversation in earshot, your work environment, the behavior of your neighbor, your family interactions and relationships, and the life and death of your plants. It all amounts to the flow of your experiences and it's reflecting your frequency or energy. Everything you experience reflects the state of your energy and gives you a message of what your energy contains. The more you acknowledge that the universe reflects back to you everything that is contained in your energy field, the clearer and bolder the message becomes. If you believe this concept, then the messages are easier to read and understand. It's important to note that you can't say that you only create some of your experiences and then blame others for the rest. Everything has a message, meaning and purpose. As you become more aware, you will notice how and why you create your attractions. Try to understand what it means whenever there is an interruption in your routine. Although there are no tangible threads that connect us, Science suggests there is an intangible source field that bridges these gaps. For example, when a person sits in a chair that previously belonged to a positive person, it can have a positive effect on their energy. The previous owner's energy can influence the person sitting in the chair and make them feel happier or more relaxed. Like the gentle ripple in a pond, this energy can spread and affect everything around it. However, it's essential to consider that multiple competing energies are always at play simultaneously. Psychometry is a technique that involves gaining insight from energetic imprints left on objects. By simply touching an object, individuals can read its history and gain insights into its previous owner through visuals, sounds, smells, tastes or emotions. This technique has led to many discoveries highlighting the power of our existence to influence our surroundings. Our emotions, actions and energies are like essential threads that shape our planet and those around us, becoming a part of a bigger tapestry. Scientific studies have demonstrated that emotions can significantly affect health. Negative emotions can reduce the effectiveness of our immune system while positive emotions can strengthen it. In the 1980s, David McClellan conducted a study where he showed a group of students a video of Mother Teresa helping the poor. During the viewing, he measured their immunoglobulin A IgA levels. IgA is an essential antibody that is crucial to our immune response. Interestingly, he observed an increase in IgA levels indicating that the video's portrayal of compassion and care had a tangible positive effect on their immune function. In 1955, Ryan, Atkinson and McCready conducted a study titled The Psychological and Physiological Effects of Compassion and Anger. This research delved into the darker side of emotions. Participants were asked to evoke and concentrate on feelings of anger. 
the results were startling. Their IgA levels dropped to half their baseline, indicating a weakened immune response. Even after six hours, these levels struggled to return to normal. Conversely, the study highlighted that emotions rooted in positivity and compassion could bolster the immune system, with effects lasting up to six hours. These findings show that our emotional states and psychological health are intertwined, emphasizing the importance of nurturing positive emotions for overall well-being. Greg Braden's research emphasizes the concept of unity consciousness, which highlights humanity's interconnectedness. The fundamental premise of his book is the exploration of lost text and wisdom, which reveals that we all move towards a significant historical moment. Furthermore, Braden asserts that every individual has innate access to the world's creative forces and compassion plays a crucial role in our existence. According to Braden, humanity is interconnected and resembles a hologram where every part contains the whole. Therefore, any change in one person can have ripple effects throughout the collective. Essentially, we are all one, and each individual embodies humanity's collective experience and wisdom. Collective resonance is a phenomenon where individual experiences and choices can profoundly affect the broader group, even if they did not directly undergo those experiences. Perception and expanding one's paradigm are powerful as shown in the story of the Spanish explorers and the tribal shaman. As an individual's perception or belief evolves, they can influence and expand the belief of the collective. Braden believes that we are at a critical historical moment where individual choices have the potential to shape our collective future. He calls for individuals to cultivate and choose pathways of understanding, peace, compassion and love. By doing so, they can influence the collective and guide humanity towards a more harmonious future. Can you share an example of when your experiences reflected deeper truths about yourself and your interconnectedness with others? How did this experience influence your understanding of karma and personal responsibility? Of course. First of all, the disclaimer. What I'm about to say is not medical advice. So my life took an unexpected turn when I sustained a severe fracture to my arm, making it impossible for me to type or engage in my usual activities. The catalyst, a slippery encounter on the bathroom tiles just moments after arriving at a serene float tank center, culminating in an urgent ambulance ride to Box Hill Hospital. The fall was caused by remnants of moisturizer on a hard bathroom tile floor. I clung to the hope that the intense pain was fleeting and that nothing was injured. Upon reaching the hospital, my reality was more daunting than I had imagined. A sharp pain came from my right elbow, which felt like jelly as I held it, and it started to swell alarmingly. I couldn't raise my left arm either, and I thought at least one arm had to be spared. At the emergency centre, both arms were subjected to the scrutiny of x-rays and the verdict was clear as day, a significant fracture in my right arm necessitating surgery. Despite the grim prognosis, I dug deep to understand what my body needed so that I could take control of it. During the hours spent in the hospital, I clung to Dr. Joe Dispenza's mantra, the power that made the body can heal the body. Fortunately, the pain reduced as long as I didn't move my arm, so I didn't take the painkillers on offer. My left arm, though injured, defied expectations, healing rapidly and regaining its strength. When the nurse delivered the sobering news of my elbow needing a pin and screws, I thanked her but said no thanks and insisted on her applying a plaster cast so I could finally leave. 
Amid the uncertainty, the orthopedic surgeon's willingness to honour my decision was a relief, so I left. Then, after 10 days at home, my arm felt heavy with the plaster and swelling, so I removed the plaster cast. I was determined to understand the message from the fall. The impact of slipping on moisturiser and falling on my elbows was so intense, I almost passed out due to the pain. The final outcome is that my arm seems to have healed really well. However, I can't fully extend my arm because of the 12 millimetre fracture that still exists. After the fall, the float tank receptionist contacted me a few times over several weeks. As she conversed with me, it was clear she wasn't being truthful. She gave me false information to cover up her tracks. Furthermore, the incident report contained numerous inaccuracies. When I initially fell and alerted her by pressing the emergency button that was in my room, she disregarded it as she thought I pressed it by accident. Later, when I managed to leave my room and contact her, I saw her playing on her phone at the reception desk. She appeared to be annoyed that I had interrupted her. The more interactions with her, the more I got a feeling of deja vu until I had an epiphany. She resembled a previous receptionist who used to work with us at Forensic Healing. For the purpose of an anonymity, let's call her Sandy. Sandy used to work part-time for us and handled administration tasks during school hours. We also briefly had another girl who had a lot of personal and lifestyle issues and tended to surround herself with toxic people at our company at that time too. My partner had hired these two individuals who agreed to an hourly rate much higher than the standard rate as it included all the extra benefits. The rate was considered a contract rate. Sandy had worked for us for several years and I treated her like a dear friend. The other girl who started working with us encouraged Sandy to make a dishonest claim to the government. Sandy did this without our knowledge and immediately resigned following a farewell we gave her with a car full of farewell gifts. A few months later, after Sandy had made the complaint, a government agent contacted us. They informed us that we had to pay several years of back pay benefits due to Sandy's fraudulent claim. I was shocked because I wasn't aware of the details and didn't fully understand the new hiring laws that had apparently changed around that time. I was in shock as we were already in debt due to the USA tour I did during the global financial crisis. It devastated us and we had to put our house on the market to pay the debt. To make matters worse, I was still suffering from chronic fatigue and chronic pain. In addition to the arsenic poisoning and barley water I ingested at age 17, I hadn't fully healed from my childhood abuse. My partner would assign me multiple responsibilities such as teaching, creating content for blogs, emails and courses and consulting with clients. He often overbooked me while he and the team handled the rest of the task. Unfortunately, Sandy's betrayal left me feeling overwhelmed and distraught. We were already going through a tough time and I felt especially betrayed after she expressed her appreciation for working with us only to go behind our backs. In a moment of impulsiveness and something I had never done prior, I took her mug from her empty desk and smashed it into the garbage bin to release my frustration. I knew my actions would harm her somehow, but I didn't care. I was simply done and had nothing left in the tank. In the subsequent years, Sandy contacted us a few times requesting that we remove any links to her in our business, which we had already done. Although Sandy didn't believe in energy healing or karma, I could sense that something must have gone wrong in her life for her to contact us. Following is a breakdown using the universal law of one, of why the situation occurred. I never fully healed from the betrayal I experienced in my childhood. This meant that I continued to attract betrayal in my life and Sandy represented the betrayal. I still had programs of hardship, struggle, victimhood and sacrifice that kept repeating themselves. My partner habitually used other people's money and did not show appreciation or interest in paying them back, which affected some of his relationships. Sandy represented my partner's actions and it was his karma. Since I was with him, I was also affected by it. 
I missed the red flags as Sandy showed signs of being untrustworthy. While working for us, she admitted to keeping receipts from a previous accounting job for a famous Hollywood person to sell them later for money. Just before the accident, I read the file my father had kept on me, which included his sorry letter of all the reasons he was ashamed and sorry I was ever born. This letter was initially given to me 30 years prior and I threw it away. This put me in a lower vibrational state and set up the fall as it was a message I was guilty, therefore I should be punished. Before my fall, I went to a family member's house who always blamed others for their problems. This person doesn't believe in energy or karma, even though they paid a person to put voodoo on an ex-family member causing them distress. As I often accommodate this person's needs more than my own, this meetup added to the setup as I often accommodate this person's needs more than my own, this meetup added to the setup for the fall as I accommodated them during the visit and stayed longer than I should have, which caused me to be in a hurry. I agreed to this experience before coming to Earth and it has given me a deep understanding of how we are the creators of our lives. It has consolidated the idea that we can't blame others for our experiences. All the information is within our energy field. This experience has made me a better person and now I'm more committed to looking within for answers. Plus, it reinforced my own power to heal myself. The surgeons were amazed at how fast and well my arm healed and they admitted that they wouldn't have recommended surgery if they knew I would heal so well. This experience reinforced my knowledge of the laws of karma. When we hurt others, we ultimately hurt ourselves. So looking back, I realized that everything was aligned for an accident to happen and I was the one who created it. Florence Scovel Shin says, there is an old saying that man only dares use his words for three purposes too heal, bless or prosper. What man says of others will be said of him and what he wishes for another, he is wishing for himself. I have many experiences about wishing well for others and how it turned around and came back on me when I was generally wanting the best for others. One of the times when I was helping out at a 10 day workshop before I started Forensic Healing and I actually wasn't in a great place because I had a healing from one of the practitioners there who created a new modality and she didn't finish the healing. She just opened up Pandora's box. She just went and said, oh yeah, something happened to me at the age of two. Oh, the abuse started back at the age of two. Oh, I don't have time to, and I don't have my books and I don't have time to complete it. I'll just make a promise to the body that I'll do it later. I didn't really feel much at the time, but I started to go downhill after that and I couldn't participate in the workshop. And I ended up on a crawled up crying and just a complete mess, a healing crisis. I was in a healing crisis. And then the actual instructor there put me back together and then I could kind of get back to assisting him, him which, would I, which I was doing for that whole week and also doing some healings and swapping. So I was, I was very grateful to be there. And what I was saying to some of the newbies there, there were some new students, I said, oh, you've just got to get the last healing on the last day. It's the best healing ever. It's when he goes right into the energy field and he goes into all the uh, chakras and aura and pulls out every bit of information that sits in your energy field. You just, that is the best healing and that's the one that you want. So make sure you put your hand up. And I was kind of like talking like this and, you know, uh, trying to help them out. And what came to the last day, and then I'm just standing at the side and then the instructor goes to find, goes to do that healing and normally he says, oh, who wants that healing? And then he would pick someone and then he just said, oh, Marisa, this healing's for you. And it's so, it happened so many times that when I'm wanting something for someone else and then I actually get it myself. And that is the law of one. It's the law of connectedness. It's the universal law that what we do at another, we do for ourselves. And what we wish for another, we wish for ourselves. So it's really an important law to learn. Anyway, piecing together these different pieces of information can feel like solving a jigsaw puzzle. It's like finding 
the perfect piece that fits snugly into its place to complete the whole picture. So in the upcoming video titled Review, Reflect and Respond, you will uncover how your life results come from your past experiences and how you are connected to everything and everyone. You will learn how the law of one applies to you to regain your power and manifestation abilities to live a life full of happiness, freedom and abundance.